Hi everyone. So uh, we're starting with chapter four today. Uh, in chapter four, um, the first part we're actually going to be talking about is just what complex numbers are. Just do a quick review. So if you've taken college algebra, then you know um, what imaginary numbers are, what complex numbers are. So this will be just a quick review for that. So uh, basically, anytime we are talking about complex numbers, we need to talk about imaginary numbers. So if you think about quadratic equations, and remember quadratic equations are equations that have um, degree 2 as its highest power. Uh, so uh, some quadratic equations can have no real solutions, uh, which generally means that if they don't have real solutions, they may have imaginary solutions. So if you look at an equation of this form, x squared plus 1 equals 0, if you go ahead and get x squared by itself on one side, and move that 1 to the other side, you end up getting x squared equals uh, negative 1. And basically, we are saying that an equation like this will have no real solution because there is no real number x uh, that uh, when you square it, you get the answer of negative 1, right? Because anytime you square a number, uh, two negatives end up becoming a positive. So since you cannot find a solution in the real number set, we're talking about how because of this deficiency, mathematicians created an expanded system of numbers using this imaginary number i, and we define the imaginary number i as square root of negative 1. So again, you should be familiar with that. And the idea is if you have i defined as square root of negative 1, and if we take a square on both sides of that, your square and square root will cancel out, giving you i squared equals negative 1. So it will be really important for you to remember that i equals square root of 1 and i squared equals negative 1. Okay? So we are saying by adding real numbers to real multiples of this imaginary unit, you actually get your complex number. So your complex number is basically going to have a real part and an imaginary part. So in the standard form, we write our complex numbers like this. So a is going to be the real number part, and bi is going to be the imaginary number part. Okay, so together they make our complex number. So they're basically saying, uh, if you look at the, for the standard form of the complex number negative 5 plus square root of negative 9, when we convert it into an imaginary uh, number and then put it together for our complex number, it will end up becoming negative 5 plus 3i. So basically what you're doing is you're separating that negative from the 9 as negative 1. We're rewriting the number 9 as 3 squared. So of course we know square root of the number 9 or square root of 3 squared will come outside as 3. And then here for this part, square root of negative 1, we're going to bring in the number i. And that's how you go from negative 5 plus square root of negative 9 to negative 5 plus 3i. So just as a definition, in your complex number, both a and b are going to be real numbers. However, with that number b, you're going to have that imaginary number i. So together, the number a plus bi is your complex number. Uh, and again, remember, this is what we call as being in the standard form. a is going to be the real number part, and bi is going to be the imaginary part, okay? Now, when we talk about the real number set, that basically means all your b values are going to be zero. So you basically end up in a form where you will have a plus zero i, and that's why we only look at the number a when we're talking about real numbers. They're saying when b is not equal to zero, uh, in that case, you end up getting your a plus bi as an imaginary number. And uh, if you only have the form of bi, which means if your a is 0, so you will end up getting 0 plus bi, which will just be bi. So anytime you have numbers in the form of just bi, we say they are pure imaginary numbers. Okay? So, um, 
basically any real number you can think about it as instead of writing it just as number a you can always write it as a plus zero i but you know obviously you know that's not our common practice so what happens is complex numbers is basically going to be your bigger set so you will have complex numbers as your bigger set and then part of that you will have a subset which is going to be the real numbers and the other subset is going to be the imaginary numbers. So basically, uh, you can think of that complex numbers being your big larger set and then these ones being smaller subsets inside of that set. Okay? Alrighty. So um, now let's get into some uh, properties and then some operations with these complex numbers. So the first thing we're talking about is equality of complex numbers. So we are saying if you have two complex numbers, a plus bi and c plus di, they will be equal to each other if you can say a plus bi is equal to c plus di if and only if your a and c values are going to be the same number and your b and d values are going to be the same number. So if you have the exact same complex number, um, then you can say they are equal to each other okay now let's get into operations with complex numbers so addition or subtraction it's really pretty straightforward when you're trying to add two complex numbers you add or again subtract whichever operation you're doing you add the real parts together and you add the imaginary parts together so um, we'll take a look at our examples here uh, in a minute but just as a quick um, application of where you can see complex numbers being used, we talk about the fast uh, Fourier uh, transform, um, which is basically uh, a type of um, process, if you want to think about it, which is used in applications like digital signal processing. And a fast Fourier uh, transform is where you will actually see how we use these com uh, operations with complex numbers to come up with our, um, you know, to do our calculations. So just something uh, that if you guys get into advanced um, mathematical courses uh, or even perhaps engineering courses, you will see more use of these complex numbers. Okay, guys, so let's talk about addition and subtraction of complex numbers. So remember, as I said, you add the real parts together and you add the imaginary parts together. So if you're adding two numbers, a plus bi with c plus di, you're going to take the real parts and add them together. And then you are going to take the imaginary parts and add them together. And same thing, of course, with your subtraction calculation. OK? OK, uh, so just some other properties you should kind of keep in mind. Your additive identity in the complex number system is going to be zero. So when we talk about additive um, identity, what we really mean by that is when you take uh, a complex number and add it with its own additive inverse, your total for that will come out to be zero. Now, what do we mean by additive inverse? Additive inverse is basically where you take the complex number and take a negation on that number so it's kind of like if you were just talking in terms of real numbers for positive one its additive inverse would be negative one and when I add them together I get zero so that same rule applies with complex numbers so if I have the complex number a plus b i and I add its additive inverse which is negative a minus b i when I add them together I get a total of zero so anytime you're working with this addition or, uh, and subtraction of complex numbers, uh, that is something you can always run into when you're working through these examples. Okay, so let's take a look at example one over here. So we are adding four plus seven i with one minus six i. Uh, so basically, that means you're going to end up adding four plus one together, which is our real parts, and you're going to take seven i minus six i or since i will be a common factor, you can just think of it being uh, 7 minus 6 and then keeping that i term. So 4 plus 1 gives you 5. 
7 minus 1 gives you positive 1, so you're basically just left with i. Or, instead of writing it as 7 minus 6 in parentheses and the i outside, you can also write this as 7i minus 6i, and you still get the same result. Okay? Over here, we are adding 1 plus 2i with 3 minus 2i. So again, you're going to take the real number parts, 1 plus 3, add them together, and then you're going to take the 2i and the minus 2i, put them together, and they will, of course, end up giving you 0i. 1 plus 3 gives you 4, and 4 plus 0i will just end up giving you the number 4. Okay? So basically, they are saying that sometimes when you add uh, two complex numbers, your answer can come out to be a real number. So the sum of two complex numbers can give you a real number like it happened here in um, example 1b over here. Okay? Okay, so let's look at another example set over here. So we've got 3i minus negative 2 plus 3i minus 2 plus 5i. So if you look at all your imaginary numbers, of course you have to be careful about distributing these uh, negative signs inside the parentheses. Okay, so that's where you've got 3i from the beginning. Negative times negative gives you positive 2i. Negative times positive will give you negative 3i over here. Negative times positive is negative 2i. Negative times positive is negative 5i. And then just combine your real number parts together, your imaginary parts together, and it looks like we end up getting negative 5i because, of course, 2 minus 2 will give you 0 over here. So sometimes adding two complex numbers can also give you uh, just pure imaginary numbers also. Same thing's going to happen over here. So remember to take this negative sign and distribute it. So that will end up becoming negative 7 and negative i. And then all the other numbers will keep their signs as it is. Combine the real parts, combine the imaginary parts. And in this case, you are actually end up with 0 as your answer because your real and imaginary parts add up to zeros. Okay, So we've got uh, examples over here where, again, we are adding or subtracting our complex numbers, and they're asking us to write the result in standard form. So remember, your standard form is a plus bi. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at these examples over here. So for 1a, we are given 7 plus 3i, and we're adding that with 5 minus 4i. So we can go ahead and write this as 7 plus 3i plus 5 minus 4i. So just getting rid of those um, parentheses, basically. Now let's put the real numbers together. So that's going to be the 7 and the 5. So that's going to be 7 plus 5 in the front. Plus, now we can take and put the imaginary parts together. So that's going to be positive 3i minus 4i. So we add the real numbers together, and then we'll add the imaginary numbers together. Uh, 7 plus 5 will, of course, give you 12. And then 3 minus 4i will actually end up giving us negative i as our answer. Okay, so this will be the answer once we go ahead and finish adding uh, the uh, complex numbers in part A. Okay, now let's take a look at part B over here. Now remember, you need to distribute this negative sign, so we will end up getting 3 plus 4i minus 5. Negative times negative is positive, so plus 3i. Then again, we'll put our real numbers together, so that's positive 3 and negative 5. And then we'll put our imaginary numbers together. So that's going to be positive 4i, positive 3i. So combining our real numbers and combining our imaginary numbers, we'll end up getting negative 2 plus 7i as our 
answer. Okay, see, so it's not too bad, I think. It, you should be able to um, go along with this, okay? So again, I'm seeing that here we are adding these two, but then we are subtracting this last number. So again, you need to distribute that negative sign. So we will end up getting 2i. Positive times negative will be negative 3. Positive times negative will be negative 4. And then here we will end up getting negative times negative is positive 3. Negative times negative is positive 3i. Okay, so let's put our real number together. So in a way you can actually think about this positive sign also being distributed if that kind of helps you because we don't want two signs lingering over here, right? We just want to combine everything together. So we have two real numbers, negative 3 and positive 3. And then we have three imaginary numbers. So that will be positive 2i, negative 4i, positive 3i. So add the real numbers together, add the imaginary numbers together, and let's see, negative 3 plus 3 will, of course, cancel each other out, giving us 0. And then we have 2i minus 4i, which will be negative 2i. Negative 2i plus 3i will end up giving us just i, right? So 0 plus i actually ends up becoming the imaginary number i just by itself. Okay? And that brings us down to our last one. So again, just remember to distribute your negative sign inside the parentheses. So we'll end up with 5 minus 3i, positive 3, positive 5i. Then that will be negative 8 and negative 2i, right? I want you to distribute that negative sign. So let's put our real numbers together. So we've got positive 5, positive 3, negative 8. And then our imaginary numbers is negative 3i, positive 5i, negative 2i. So let's see, negative 3i, positive 5i, negative 2i. Okay, very good. Now we want to go ahead and add all the real numbers together, add all the imaginary numbers together. So 5 plus 3 is 8. 8 minus 8 will give you 0. And then over here, negative 3i plus 5i will be positive 2i. And then positive 2i minus 2i will actually end up becoming 0. So you actually have 0 plus 0i, which we know comes out to be the number 0 in this case. So again, uh, you can kind of see how each of these examples are a little bit different and how you end up getting a little bit of a different answer for each one of them. So just make sure you go through those. Okay, so that was our addition and subtraction. Now let's talk about uh, some properties of real numbers that also are valid for complex numbers. So you have your associative properties of addition and multiplication. So if you remember your... Um, Associate properties for addition, for addition, it's basically going to be if we took A plus B plus C, that would be the same thing as A plus B plus C. Okay, for addition, for multiplication, that just becomes A multiplied with BC is the same thing as AB multiplied with C. So it's basically about grouping. When we talk about uh, commutative properties of addition and multiplication, commutative is A plus B is the same thing as B plus A. In multiplication, A times B is the same thing as B times A. Now, when you talk about the distributive property of multiplication over addition, we're, of course, talking about if you had something like A on the outside, B plus C on the inside, then you can distribute that number and you can get A times B plus A times C. So all of these properties that are true for real numbers will also be true for uh, complex numbers. So that's basically what we're talking about here. 
And then in this little example, they're just kind of showing you how those uh, different properties work. So what they are doing here is basically taking this uh, a value and multiplying it with the entire second parentheses and then they're taking this bi value and again multiplying it with the entire second parentheses so they're using distributive property over here okay and then um, just cleaning it up so they know i square will become negative one and then over here we are bringing our real parts together bringing our imaginary parts together and then basically just uh, putting them into uh, groups over here okay so um, basically anytime you think about multiplying two complex numbers instead of going through this procedure that they're showing you over here which I'm not a big fan of because um, we are so comfortable doing FOIL that it actually makes it easier for us to just go ahead and use the FOIL method instead of trying to uh, you know do it the way they're showing you over here in this example so let's take a look at a few examples that we have over here so multiplying complex numbers so here you're basically using the distributive property take this number four and distribute it inside the parentheses so you get four times negative two which is negative eight four times three i will end up giving you a positive 12 i and there you go you are done of course, here you'll need to use the FOIL method and then clean up your answer. So we're multiplying and getting our answers as 8 plus 6i minus 4i minus 3i squared. Now, anytime you see i squared, you have to change it into negative 1. So negative uh, 3 times negative 1 becomes positive 3. You're combining that with the real number 8 and then bringing our imaginary numbers together. For a final answer of 11 plus 2i you're again using the foil method here but you can see these if you remember these are what we call as conjugates because you have the same terms but you have a plus and a minus sign so it's basically you are multiplying a plus b with a minus b and remember that gives you your difference of squares uh, because your two middle terms these guys will cancel each other out so that positive uh, 6i and negative 6i cancel each other out and uh, you are just left with the square of the first term minus the square of the last term and again your i square becomes negative 1 and you actually end up getting a real number as your answer so anytime you're multiplying conjugates you're going to get a real number as your answer and I think we're going to talk about that here in a little bit now this one here, again, since this is to the second power, you write it out twice and you go ahead and FOIL your answer so you can do it this way. Or if you remember from your algebra course, this guy, when you're multiplying, always ends up giving you square of the first term plus two times uh, the first and the last term plus at the end the square of the last term. If you don't remember this rule, just write it out like they are showing you here and then use the FOIL method. So again, remember to change your i square into negative 1. And then when you clean up your answer, you end up with 5 plus 12i. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at these examples so we can actually perform our multiplication and see what kind of answers we come up with. So we're looking at number 2 over here. So for this first part, of course, we're going to take the negative 5 and distribute it inside our parentheses. So that will end up giving us negative 5 times 3 and then negative 5 times negative 2i. So this will end up giving us negative 5 times 3 is negative 15. Negative times negative will become positive. 5 times 2i will become 10i. So you end up with negative 15 plus 10i as your answer over here this guy of course we have to use the foil method so that's going to be the first the outer the inner and the last terms so that will give us two times three which will of course be six then we are going to do two times 
3i, which will end up giving us 6i. Then we are going to do negative 4i multiplied with 3. So that will end up giving us negative 12i. And then the last terms would be negative 4i multiplied with 3i. So negative 4 times positive 3 is negative 12. i times i becomes i squared. But then we need to remember i squared becomes negative 1. So we have 6 plus 6i minus 12i minus 12. But now this i squared is going to become negative 1, okay? And then negative times negative will end up giving us positive 12. I have 6 here. And then uh, you can go ahead and combine these two terms over here. So that will end up giving us positive 6i minus 12i, which will be minus 6i. And then all you have to do is add the real number parts, the 6 plus 12, will end up giving us 18, and we get 18 minus 6i. Now remember, guys, you always need to write these answers in standard form, so that always has to be the real number first and then the imaginary number second. So 18 minus 6i is what this answer will come out to be. Okay? So I'm breaking it down a little bit more. You don't have to break it down as much as I am. You can go about doing it how you want. Now this one... You can use the FOIL method, or you can remember that this is A plus B being multiplied by A minus B, which will give you A squared minus B squared, because you can see these are both 4 and 4, 5i and 5i. The only difference is one uh, factor is positive, one factor is negative. So these are, remember, what we call as conjugates. Okay, so how about I show you with the A plus B? Uh, b times a minus b gives you a squared minus b squared, and then I'll show you the FOIL method. So in this method, you take your first term, square it, minus, take your second term, and square it. So 4 squared is 16, minus 5i squared, so 5 times 5 would be 25. i squared, i times i would of course be i squared, and then you need to rewrite that i squared as negative 1, so we have 16, uh, negative 25 times negative 1 will become positive 25, and then 16 plus 25 will of course end up giving you 41. So if you use the a square minus b square method, uh, you will have no middle terms and you come to your answer pretty quickly. Now if you wanted to use the FOIL method, the FOIL method of course, would be where we multiply the first terms, the outer terms, the inner terms, and the last terms. So that would end up giving us 4 times 4, which would be 16. And then, let's see, positive 4 times negative 5i, which would give us negative 20i. In the inner uh, multiplication, I would end up getting positive 5i multiplied with 4, which would give us positive 20i. And then our last term would be positive 5i multiplied with negative 5i. So that would be negative 25i squared. So again, you can see negative 20i, positive 20i cancel each other out. You're left with 16 minus 25. And again, I'm going to write that i squared as negative 1. 16, and then negative 25 times negative 1 is positive 25. And when you add those numbers together, you get 41. So you're going to get the same result no matter what. So you can just see whichever uh, one seems easier for you and go ahead and use that. And again, guys, remember, i squared will equal negative 1. Okay, so this was number C. And then the last one here is uh, 4 plus 2i, the whole thing raised to the second power. So you can write this either as 4 plus 2i multiplied with itself, 4 plus 2i, and then you can use the FOIL method. Or if you remember the formula, this here would be a squared plus 2ab 
plus b squared. So again, if you use the formula, then this will actually come out to be, take your first term, square it, plus 2 times your first term, your last term, plus square your last term. So this is using this formula over here. So 4 squared would be 16. In the middle, 2 times 4 is 8. 8 times 2 is again 16, so you would end up getting 16i plus 2i squared. So 2 times 2 is 4. i times i is i squared. Again, you need to remember i squared equals negative 1. So we have 16 plus 16i plus 4 multiplied by negative 1. 16 plus 16i, positive 4, negative 1 will make this negative 4. Combine your real parts together, so that's 16 minus 4, which will be 12, and you end up getting a final answer of 12 plus 16i. Okay, so this is using our formula over here. Now, if you wanted to use the FOIL method, then back to what we did before. So this will end up giving us 4 times 4, which will be 16. Then you are doing plus 4 times 2i, which would be 8i, plus 2i times 4, which will again be 8i. And then my last would be 2i times 2i, which would be 4i squared. So we've got 16 plus our two middle terms is 8i plus 8i. That adds up to 16i, right? These guys here. And then plus 4, I'm going to replace my i squared with negative 1. 16 plus 16i minus 4. 16 minus 4 gives you 12. And then plus 16i. So either way, you are getting the same answer. So you can use FOIL. You can use the formula. Same thing in part C. You can use FOIL or use the formula. And then this one, of course, we had no option. You had to use FOIL over here. And then this one was just your simple distributive property. So just kind of look through these different types of examples and see which one um, seems the best option to you. Okay? Alrighty, so I've been talking about complex conjugates. So again, that was example 2C here or example 2C over here so they're saying notice in example 2c that the product of the two complex numbers can be a real number so for this example 2c we got 13 as our answer and for our example 2c we got 41 as our answer right so they are saying when you're multiplying uh, two complex numbers you can get a real number answer and this happens when your complex numbers are a conjugate pair. So when they are complex conjugates and you multiply them, their product is going to be a real number. And so you can kind of see they are using this FOIL method and multiplying the two complex numbers together. Your middle terms will cancel each other out. So you're just left with the first term and the last term. Um, I square will become negative one. So negative times negative ends up giving you positive. And you will notice that I, basically, because it got rid of itself by becoming negative 1, you don't have the uh, imaginary number I left behind when you multiply this complex conjugates. So just a couple examples here with multiplying complex conjugates. They are saying multiply each complex number by its complex conjugates. So if you have 1 plus I here, its complex conjugate is going to be 1 minus i, so that's what we're doing here. And you end up getting 1 minus negative 1, or basically 1 plus 1, which gives you 2. The complex conjugate for 4 minus 3i will be 4 plus 3i. So remember, same terms, you just switch the sign in the middle. So when you multiply those together, just go through your calculation, and you end up getting... Um, positive 25 as your answer. So again, every time you multiply concept complex conjugates, you get real numbers as your answers. So we're doing a similar kind of thing over here in our example. 
uh, 3. So let's go ahead and see what happens when we multiply these guys by their complex conjugates. So for the first part, we are given 3 plus 6i. So we will multiply this by its complex conjugate. So you're multiplying 3 plus 6i with 3 minus 6i. So I am going to be using uh, this idea of a plus b multiplied by a minus b, which gives you a square minus b square. Or you can use this formula here where we multiply complex conjugates and you get a square plus b square. So if you want to use that, this will be a plus bi multiplied with a minus bi, which gives you a square plus b square. And remember, this becomes plus because of that i square being negative 1, right? You can see how this i square is negative 1. So negative times negative ends up making that into a positive. So either way, whichever one works for you, whichever one you think will be uh, easy to remember. And if you don't remember, just use FOIL. So that means if I use my complex conjugate idea, then I will take my 3 squared plus my 6 squared, and I will end up with 3 squared is 9, 6 squared is 36, and when I add them together, I get a total of 45. So this is where I'm using this uh, a squared plus b squared idea to find my answer. Okay. For part b, you are given 2 minus 5i. When you multiply by its complex conjugate, that would be 2 plus 5i. So again, using this a squared plus b squared formula, uh, we can write this a squared would be 2 squared plus b squared would be 5 squared. So 2 squared is 4, 5 squared is 25, and of course this will add up to give us a total of 29. Okay, so you can see the formulas really make it go a lot faster, but you can use whichever method you're most comfortable with. So this was multiplying our complex conjugates. Now let's talk about when we are trying to find a quotient of complex numbers, what happens? So they are saying to write the quotient of a plus bi and c plus di in standard form. So that's what they're talking about here. a plus bi divided by c plus di, where both c and d are not equal to 0. So one of them could be 0, but both of them uh, cannot be 0 at the same time. Because remember, division by 0 is undefined. So we don't want it to be. Uh, 0 for both C and D in the denominator. So the way you actually work through this type of a problem is you take the denominator and multiply by its conjugate. So you're going to multiply both the numerator and the denominator by the conjugate of your uh, denominator uh, expression. So the denominator, when you multiply, you will end up getting C squared plus D squared. And then on the numerator, you will actually have to use FOIL uh, to go ahead and simplify the numerator. And since we have to put this in the standard form, your standard form will end up looking something like this. Now, hopefully, we will be able to simplify it, and they won't look like what it's looking here in the general form. But that's what you kind of have to remember uh, to separate the real number part from the imaginary part. Okay? Now, one thing before we look at the example here is you can see how here in this uh, expression we are multiplying both numerator and denominator by c minus di over c minus di, right? So in this remark, they're basically saying since we're multiplying both numerator and denominator by this conjugate expression, basically you are multiplying your quotient by uh, number 1. So you're not changing the value of your original expression, you're just kind of helping uh, us uh, by doing this to simplify our expression, okay? So it's kind of like the same thing if you were, uh, you know, when we find common denominators, how if you have two-thirds and we want to add it with, I don't know, five, six, to make this guy into a six, then we would go ahead and multiply this side by two on the top and two on the bottom, so we, to maintain the balance of our 
uh, fraction and not to change the value. So that's kind of the same thing you are doing here by multiplying the numerator and denominator by the same expression. So let's take a look at our example over here. Uh, so you are given, and I don't know if you guys can see that, it's a little small. This is uh, 2 plus 3i divided by 4 minus 2i. So since it's 4 minus 2i on our denominator, we're multiplying both numerator and denominator by 4 plus 2i and 4 plus 2i. So your denominator will end up becoming uh, 16 plus 4, which will then become 20. And then go ahead and FOIL your numerator. And when you simplify that, it looks like it ends up becoming 2 plus uh, 16i over 20. So if you have 2 plus 16i over 20, you can go ahead and separate that denominator of 20. So 2 goes into itself once, 2 goes into 20 10 times, so that's where this 1 over 10 is coming from. And then 16 and 20 are both uh, have a common factor of 4. So 16 goes into 4 4 times, 20 goes into 4 5 times, so that's where you're getting this 4 fifth. And then, of course, you keep your i um, from that imaginary number part. Okay, so this is how you separate your quotient and put it into standard form. So the real part has to be separate from the imaginary part. Okay, so let's go ahead and see how we can apply this for our example over here. Uh, so we are given 2 plus i divided by 2 minus i. Okay, so let's go ahead and see how we can simplify this. So remember to solve our quotient you are going to multiply by the conjugate of the denominator. So my denominator is 2 minus i. So its conjugate will be 2 plus i. Okay. Which in this case actually happens to be our numerator value, but that's not always going to happen. So in this case, you're basically going to end up multiplying 2 plus i and 2 plus i on the numerator and 2 minus i with 2 plus i in the denominator. So for the denominator, I am going to use a plus bi multiply with a minus bi is equal to a squared plus b squared. For the numerator, uh, since they are the same expression, you basically have a plus b uh, raised to the second power. So this guy comes out to be a squared plus 2 times AB plus B squared. Okay, so you can use those rules or you can always, always, always use FOIL. So if you don't want to use these rules. Okay, so let's see what we end up getting over here. So on the numerator, by using my formula on the top, I will end up getting 2 squared plus 2 times a, a is going to be 2. My b value uh, in this case is actually going to be 1i, or you can just write it as i, okay? And then my b squared will, of course, be i squared, okay? Now, on the denominator... Uh, you are actually going to have your a squared value as 2 squared and your b squared, because remember this b squared is coming from the coefficient of i, so this b squared value is actually going to be 1 squared. So for the denominator, since we are using this rule over here uh, for a plus bi minus a minus times a minus bi, you just have to look at the coefficient, so that's going to be positive 2 for the a value and um, positive 1 or negative 1, depending on what you're looking at, but 1 is going to be the b value. So you're not actually going to be using i over here, you're going to be using 1. So this will end up giving us 4 plus 4i four on the top, and then remember, i squared equals negative 1. 
So this guy here will actually end up becoming negative 1. And then on the denominator, we'll have 2 squared, which is 4. And then 1 squared will, of course, be just 1. So this will end up becoming 4 minus 1 is 3 on the top, plus r, 4i. And then on the denominator, 4 plus 1 will become 5. Now remember, you have to put this in the standard form, so we need to take our 3 plus 4i and divide each one of these by that denominator of 5 to get our answer separately. And actually, it would be better to write it this way, 3 fifths plus 4 fifths, and then put the i on the outside. Okay? So this here is going to be the final format of our answer, but always make sure when you're done with your quotient, separate that real part from the imaginary part. Okay, so this is how we go about looking at example four over here. Okay, so the next thing we want to talk about is um, the principal square root idea here, but they're basically saying what happens when you get complex solutions from your quadratic equations. So the first thing uh, we want to talk about is, you know, if you have the number square root of negative 3, then of course we can bring out that negative sign as square root of negative 1 and rewrite it as i. So if you're given square root of negative 3, separate that negative 1 and that negative 1, will uh, the square root of negative 1 will end up becoming i and then the square root of 3 will continue to stay inside square root of 3. Now your textbook likes to write it this way, but normally because you don't know if you are looking at 3i where the i is on the inside or are you looking at square root of 3 and the i is on the outside. So we actually prefer to write the i in the front and write the square root of 3 in the back. So the general notation here is you put um, if you have uh, a non-radical number uh, you would put it in the front. If you have the number i, i goes in the middle. And if you have a radical that's left over, you would put it after. So you end up writing it as a in the front, i in the middle, and then square root of b in the back. Okay? So, uh, and I kind of have that mentioned over here to write it like this. And we would call this the principal square root of negative 3. Now what happens if you have the principal square root of a negative number? So when they are saying when a is a positive real number, the principal square root of negative a is going to end up becoming square root of a i, or like I said, I prefer to write it as i in the front and square root of a in the back. So let's see what happens uh, in this little remark over here. We're saying the definition of this uh, principal square root uses this rule where you are separating your negative sign, right, from the number itself. So we separate this as square root of a multiplied by square root of b. And in this case, a is a positive number, but b is a negative number. Now they are saying this rule is not valid when both a and b are negative. So just for an example to see what happens when both your numbers are negative, we have square root of negative 5 multiplied with square root of negative 5. So if I separate that negative sign from my number 5, I end up getting square root of 5i, square root of 5i, or you can think of it as i times square root of 5 multiplied by i times square root of 5. So i times i will end up becoming i squared, square root of 5 times square root of 5, will end up becoming square root of 25, which of course square root of 25 then becomes the number 5, and we're looking at 5i square. Again, that i square will become negative 1, giving you an answer of negative 5. So that's basically what happens is when you multiply square roots of two negative numbers, you will actually eventually end up getting a negative answer behind. However, if inside the same radical, you are multiplying negative 5 with negative 5, the negative times negative becomes positive, 
5 times 5 becomes square root of um, 25 and of course positive square root of 25 ends up giving you uh, 5 as your answer. So what they are saying, be sure to convert your complex numbers to standard form before multiplying any operation. So convert your complex numbers to standard form before performing any operations. So let's go ahead and take a look at our example over here. So you can see we have square root of negative 3 multiplied with square root of negative 12. So we are converting these into standard form. So you're taking that negative sign and turning it into an i. Same thing for square root of negative 12. You're taking that negative sign, turning it into a square root, uh, sorry, uh, uh, into the imaginary number i. So i times i becomes i squared. Square root of 3 multiplied by square root of 12 gives a square root of 36. Square root of 36 is 6. i squared becomes negative 1 and you end up getting negative 6 as your answer. So remember what I said when you're taking the product of two square roots that have a negative number on the inside, you are going to get a negative in your final answer. Now here we are subtracting. So you've got square root of negative 48 minus square root of negative 27. So this guy will become square root of 48 and then negative comes outside as i. This guy will become square root of 27 and again the negative comes outside as i. Now we need to simplify both the square root of 48 and square root of 27. So that becomes 4 times square root of 3i and this is the one I was saying. I would actually write this as 4i square root of 3 minus 3i square root of 3. So you can see I have i square root of 3i square root of 3 on both of these. So you are just doing 4 minus 3 which gives you 1 and so you end up with 1i square root of 3 or basically just i square root of 3 as your answer for this guy. Okay. Um, this uh, last one here you've got a negative 1 plus square root of negative 3 to the second power. Rewrite that square root of negative 3 as 3 uh, square root of 3 and then i on the outside. And then, you know, of course, you have to do FOIL uh, or use the rule over here um, that I talked about. So that's, again, a plus b squared is a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. So you can use that here and then basically simplify your um, final answer. Okay, so let's take a look at this in action and see how we can simplify something like example 5 over here. Okay, so we are given square root of negative 14 multiplied with square root of negative 2. So let's look at square root of negative 14. You can write that as negative 1 times 14. And then for the second one, same thing, negative 1 times 2. So if you separate your radical, you would have square root of negative 1, square root of 14 from here square root of negative 1, square root of 2 from here. So square root of negative 1 and square root of negative 1 will end up becoming i and i, right? Square root of 14, 14 can only be broken down into 7 times 2, so neither one of those numbers are going to be perfect squares, so we won't actually be able to simplify these, so this guy will stay as square root of 14. And then, of course, square root of 2 will stay as it is. Now you can go ahead and multiply i times i, which will, of course, give us i squared. And then we can multiply square root of 4 with square root of 2. So they will end up becoming... Um, oops, 14 times 2 will, of course, become 28. And then your i squared, again, remember i squared equals negative 1, so this guy will become negative 1 in the front. Negative times the square root of uh, 28 will become negative square root of 28. But now 28 uh, can be simplified inside your radical because now I can write 28 as 
4 times 7, right? And we know 4 is a perfect square. So then you can separate these two. 4 will, of course, become uh, positive 2 and then square root of 7. But then you still have this negative sign that is lingering on from this i square, which ended up becoming a negative, right? So this negative sign will basically carry forward till you get to the end. And this is what your final answer is going to look like. So don't stop here because your answer is not simplified at this stage. You have to go all the way down uh, by simplifying square root of 28 where you get negative 2 square root of 7 as your answer. Okay? So this is kind of how we would simplify number 5 over here. Now, the last thing we actually want to talk about is the uh, complex solution. So now that we know how to simplify these, now let's look at how we can solve our quadratic equation uh, with complex solutions. So as you can see, we're basically using our quadratic formula over here. So you've got your a, b, and c values coming from your quadratic equation. Plug it into your quadratic formula and you will see we end up with negative 56 inside that square root. So this is where we will need to simplify it and then separate our answers into the real and the imaginary parts. And we had actually looked at examples like this in our college algebra course. Again, if you remember that, you should be able to use that information to help you out again. Uh, and as they are saying, you can go to section P2 uh, to help you uh, review the quadratic formula. So let's go ahead and take a look at our example over here. We are given 8x squared plus 14x plus 9 equal 0. So again, to refresh your memory, remember your quadratic formula. And that's going to be x equals negative b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac and that whole thing divided by 2a. So this is our a value, positive 8, positive 14 is b value, positive 9 is our c value. So let's put it into our quadratic formula. So that would be negative 14 plus or minus square root, uh, which would be 14 squared minus 4 times 8 times 9 divided by 2 times 8. Okay, so let's see, this negative 14 will stay as it is. Inside the square root, we've got 14 squared, which of course will come out to be 196, and then 4 times 8 times 9 comes out to be 288 and then of course uh, 2 times 8 on the denominator gives you 16. Subtract the numbers inside your square root so 196 minus uh, 288 will actually end up giving us negative 92 and then we've got 16 on the bottom so we need to simplify this negative uh, 92 inside our square root. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. So the first thing you can do is just separate that negative uh, sign from the 92 and then you want to find factors for 92 where you can bring out a um, perfect square, right? Something like a 4 or a 16 or a 25 or a 9 or something like that. So you can start dividing 92 by any of those numbers and see which one works. And you know what? Let's go ahead and take that square root of negative 1 outside. And then your 92, you can actually break it down into 4 times 23. Square root of negative 1 will become i. Square root of 4 will come outside as 2 and you will be left with 23 inside your radical. So you can rewrite this as 2 in the front, i in the middle, and square root of 23 on the outside. So this is the simplified answer for our square root 
of negative 92. So when you write it over here, I'm going to write negative 14 plus or minus, and this time I will have 2i square root of 23 divided by 16. And now we are actually ready to separate our real and the imaginary parts. So let's write this as negative 14 over 16 plus or minus 2i square root of 23 over 16. These are still fractions, so we still want to simplify them. So you should see that both 14 and 16 are divisible by 2. So 14 goes into 2 7 times, and you will still have that negative sign left behind. And 16 goes into 2 8 times, right? And then on the imaginary side, 2 goes into itself once, and 2 goes into 16 again 8 times. So when we write this, you should have negative 7 8 from the real part, plus or minus my 2 canceled out, so I'm just left with i square root of 23 over 8. And then just to put it in the final format, I would have negative 7 8 plus or minus square root of 23 over 8 and then i on the outside. Okay, so this is how you will write your final answer for our quadratic formula. Sorry, our quadratic equation over here. So of course you can see we did not get a real uh, answer for this. We're getting uh, an imaginary answer for this uh, equation over here. Okay, so just uh, to kind of show you how these complex numbers work and how we can use different operations with the complex numbers. So look through this handout, look through the video, let me know if you guys have any questions. So we'll talk about this in our next class and uh, answer any questions you guys might have, okay? So everyone be careful, stay safe, and I will see you in class next time. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.